Yeah, um, I'm hoping to add to Ethereum um, soon, um, and I will probably continue to add to that because if I look at the chart of Ethereum versus Bitcoin, it looks like it's basing. Usually, it's, Ethereum is also very much following the 2017 Bitcoin cycle, both in price, in number of wallet addresses, in market cap. I mean, it's identical. It's, it's kind of spooky. that Ethereum was exactly mirroring Bitcoin. When I say exactly, when I look at it on a plot graph with the same regression, it looks similar. Because it started later, it just follows Bitcoin earlier. But in fact, its adoption, i.e. the number of wallets at this time, is actually a faster rate of adoption than Bitcoin had. Their prices are identical and their price movements have been identical. The old way is you make a bit of cash, you stick it in a bank, you look for a term deposit, you earn a bit of interest, and that's your reserve, right? So that's right. it turns into an annuity for yourself. Yeah, and it, and you might have been slightly apocalyptical, so you might have had some gold as well. So that was your our previous reserve asset. Right. And now people look at Bitcoin. But my only thought about that, okay, I can see that. Not easy to do with a 70 vol asset that falls 80% every four years. That's my only struggle is, we all talk about reserves that asset right now, right. but once the, your new house has disappeared out the window and you're now only looking at buying a new car, you're like, I need to sell some of this stuff. That's yeah. my only issue. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's why it hasn't happened yet. But the question is, once Bitcoin gets to 10 trillion and think about how much in Bitcoin uh, value, how much is moving off of exchanges uh, so that it's, you know, in, in dollar terms, there's still more, more on exchanges than there was a couple of years ago, but in Bitcoin terms, it's way less. Um, and so as that continues to happen, I think those 80% drawdowns have to stop because it's, it's, it's no longer a, a kind of real time tradable asset in the traditional sense, at least not in the first, you know, first generation sense. It truly is at that point a store of value and that transition has then happened. We're in the middle of the transition. You can't have a transition to, to anything like this without volatility. It's like saying, how do I get my car from zero to 100 kilometers per hour? Well, you have to get to 10, you have to get to 20, you have to get to 40. It's physically impossible to get to 100 without those steps in between. Well, that's what's happening with the price of, of Bitcoin right now. And and so, but once you're at 100, you can stay 100, right? You can choose to decelerate or not, but but this is the price we have to pay. And, and for us as the people on the front lines, right, we should be getting the benefit of that. That's what we I'm like, look at these charts. Bitcoin is about to eat the world, right? Looks like it's going to become the super black hole of which it's going to outperform every single asset class on earth. I've never seen this before. Literally, I've never seen it. You know, we've seen a gold might be dominant, but you might have bought copper instead, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing, nothing, not even most of the Amazon and stuff like that. It looks like it's going to outperform Bitcoin. So that's when I start saying, okay, this is the time to really go for it because it's a waste of capital to put it into anything else. Now, I'm not coming at this with the philosophy, you know, the Bitcoinization of the world or anything else. I'm coming at here as a macro guy, saying I've never seen a more dominant opportunity in my entire lifetime. And if that is the case, it's time to really back your bet. I'm hoping to add to Ethereum um, soon, um, and I will probably continue to add to that because if I look at the chart of Ethereum versus Bitcoin, it looks like it's basing. Usually, it's, Ethereum is also very much following the 2017 Bitcoin cycle, both in price, in number of wallet addresses, in market cap. I mean, it's identical. It's, it's kind of spooky, mm. which tells you this is being driven by Metcalfe's law and adoption effects than almost anything else. Mm. So if that's the case, then we know Ethereum has a decent chance of getting to 20,000, considering right now it's at 11,800. Oh, sorry, um, 1,180. 1, yeah. I mean, I mean, holy shit. That that's a that's a value proposition. Even with Bitcoin going to 200,000 to 300,000, one's 8x, one's 16x from here. Yeah, um, I'm hoping to add to Ethereum um, soon. Um, and I will probably continue to add to that 
because if I look at the chart of Ethereum versus Bitcoin, it looks like it's basing. Usually, it's, Ethereum is also very much following the 2017 Bitcoin cycle, both in price, in number of wallet addresses, in market cap. I mean, it's identical. It's, it's kind of spooky. And that Ethereum was exactly mirroring Bitcoin. When I say exactly, when I look at it on a plot graph with the same regression, it looks similar because it started later it just follows Bitcoin earlier. But in fact, its adoption, i.e. the number of wallets at this time, is actually a faster rate of adoption than Bitcoin had. Their prices are identical, and their price movements have been identical. That's when I say ETH equals Bitcoin, is because when you think of it in macro terms, they're both really network effects. And so they may have very different properties. There may be different things entirely. And people struggle with value when it comes to network effects. They, almost everybody underestimates value by definition because we try and anchor it on something that we perceive as value. But network effects are so hard to think in because they're exponential. Also, I think the... I think one of the things we're talking about here, and again, I wrote in that long article uh, that I wrote in Global Macro Investor about this, is S-curves are very prevalent in this. And the S-curve is, it's either the questioning point or the failure point. And you know what, what we're saying here is there's a big S-curve in, in Ethereum right now coming up. And will it work or will it not work? We don't know. Almost all of the currencies have had this. Bitcoin's had several S-curve moments where it could have failed. And it didn't. So then the Lindy effect takes place, which is the longer it survives, the more likely it's to survive. So again, it's why we're all really interested in this space, because there are outcomes of which we don't know. We can't figure out the probabilities. We've got no historical parallels. So it's it's a really interesting space for all of us to try and figure this out, because you know what S-curve is just a pause before the rise. And maybe that's what I think Ethereum is going through. Again, I don't know, we'll find out. Um, and, you know, and that moves and drives us further up Mexican Metcalf's law and the Lindy effect. Some of these SMLs have seen to I think, anyway. And, and so I don't think that the people who use it 10 years from now are going to look at it that way because it's not going to be going up and down in price the way, the way it is now. Yeah, and also there's a number of things with that is as you go up the quality spectrum, Volatility falls. So yeah. fixed income's got the lowest hole of all, then FX, you know, then equities. You know. So we, we kind of know as it goes, it loses volatility over time. Also, I don't know how much of the volatility of Bitcoin is actually the volatility of fiat money overall, because you know that's another part of this equation, is what is the volatility of M2 right now? You know, th these are things we've never really had to deal with before. Right. And I think, right. you know, I've been looking at some charts, spending time thinking about. Okay, what does the S and P look like in um, in Fed balance sheet terms? And bizarrely enough, there's been no bull market really. It's just kind of traded sideways since 2008, yeah. and that's like, huh. Yeah. And when you look at gold versus equities, they've kind of been in the same range. Yeah. They're both just a store of value. Yes, and so therefore, I then looked at gold versus basket of 27 global currencies, excluding the dollar, to give me an idea of what is fiat currency doing versus gold, because gold is like the trusted understanding of value. Fascinating is those currencies have underperformed gold since the global financial crisis by 60%. Wow. Saying what it's kind of suggesting to me is there is a currency devaluation of fiat, not of the individual currencies against each other, not dollars against euros, right. but of all fiat because of right. we just seen the Reserve Bank of Australia today implementing yield curve control. That's basically right. unlimited printing of money if anybody sells them a bond. So when I look at that and I think, wow, has all fiat currency fallen 60%? And this is the bit that we're missing when we look at volatility yes. of Bitcoin. Are we measuring the wrong thing even? We are. Get my head around this. Not easy to do with a 70 vol asset that falls 80% every four years. Looks like it's going to become the super black hole of which it's going to outperform every single asset class. Usually, it's, Ethereum is also very much following the 2017 Bitcoin cycle. Those currencies have underperformed gold since the global financial crisis by 60%.